<laughs> All right, welcome everyone. So this is an official roundtable around uh, the topic of emergence and mapping. Um, I'd like to acknowledge our panelists first. So um, Praveen and Sahil from NID. Um, Berger, where, where are you? I see you there somewhere. Um, Jonathan Rahm couldn't make it, uh, but Mari is here in his place. Uh, Peter Jones, I believe, has joined us as well. Yes. And um, uh, Yota, you are here as well. I saw you before. Welcome. And uh, also Lorraine. I think that's everyone. So as I was saying, I we, we have some panelists here, but really my hope is that this is an open conversation about the process of mapping, the power of mapping, the limitations of mapping, um, and particularly using the idea of emergence as a way to, um, to, to sort of funnel and channel our thinking about that topic. Um, someone asked earlier if I could sort of give a introduction to the idea of emergence and why it might be relevant for mapping. Um, so for those who are maybe new to, to systems thinking, uh, emergence is really a fundamental characteristic of all systems, where once you have different components of a system interacting together, what you get is a result that is unpredictable, um, or at least something you could not predict from looking at the interactions of the parts themselves, right? It's something new that comes out of the system that was not there before, that cannot be reduced to those parts, um, and uh, really must come out when the system is actually dynamic, when it's in motion. Uh, and this principle we see all the time, right? So um, at a really sort of basic fundamental material level, right? If you have a glass of water, which is just a bunch of water molecules bumping into each other all the time, um, temperature is something that emerges from that, right? Um, if you think about social systems uh, and you've got a bunch of, uh, you know, people who are all interacting, right? Um, maybe something that comes out of that that emerges is um, you know, so joy or happiness, right? Or, um, or, or uh, something even more fundamental uh, to, um, to the way that people are uh, making decisions, right? Um, so these things that happen when components of a system come together um, are unpredictable. They are often at a much higher scale than um, the interactions of those people or those components themselves. And these are really hard things to capture in um, a sort of static representation, right? And so um, usually we would use things like simulation to capture emergence, sort of like agent-based models are really good at capturing this kind of thing. Um, but in systemic design, we focus largely on the idea of gigamapping, systems mapping, synthesis mapping, no matter what you call it, um, as a way of capturing the essence of the system, its individual components, and understanding their interrelations. So really what I'd like to do for this time right now is to think a little bit about how um, that process and that artifact can capture and represent the emergence in that system. Um, and I've got a few questions that I will put in the chat right now that we can use to start our conversation. Um, but I just want to let each of the sort of discussants take a moment and um, just say something about the way that they feel uh, emergence has entered into their mapping process or the way that they represent emergence in their in their mapping. Um, I will, uh, Praveen, you're on my screen here on the right, so I will start with you. Um, say a little bit about uh, how emergence affects your process and practice. So, uh, yeah, uh, I mean, we uh, at NID, I think we work on, uh, you know, uh, the problems and issues of multiple uh, complexity. And uh, uh, those projects uh, very often involves uh, multiple stakeholders, multiple, you know, uh, type of information. And uh, when you actually, uh, it's not exactly in the mapping, but I think when people work in the class, uh, in the rich uh, design space uh, where uh, you know people are putting things together there is some kind of uh, patterns start emerging which uh, you know uh, which are normally you don't see 
uh, in isolation. And uh, that is something I think uh, uh, is very fascinating part of uh, the process. But how uh, that translates into a mapping and you know get represented, that's much later part. Uh, but I think uh, the, the the process of having you know uh, doing things in the rich you know design space and you know slowly uh, sort of progressing towards finding those patterns. Sahil, you want to add? Yeah, and also uh, because India is very uh, uh, pluralistic, and because of the way there's divergence and there's diversity in terms of uh, social, culture, and political. So the classroom sort of, again, becomes a microcosm of the entire world, right? So uh, the sort of mixing of students, mixing of stakeholders also leads to the phenomenon of emergence. So people in the beginning might not even imagine what they'll end up coming up because that one uh, sort of meeting with uh, a stakeholder could change the course of their entire project. So I think being in the field, working with the people sort of adds a lot of these movements and also a lot of these moment in the course, which leads to the aha movement or at times uh, looking at a new perspective and then mapping uh, the entire thing becomes a part of the bigger picture. So I think uh, the diversity also leads to the phenomenon of emergence when we are looking at projects from a NID's perspective. So that is something, uh, that's how I see uh, emergence happening in our classroom settings, yeah. Uh, would someone else like to chime in? Uh, maybe Mari, since you're next on my screen there. Okay, thank you. Well, I'm thinking myself that um... I work with services and, and with bigger problems in service design and looking how the complexities we face when we design, for example, public services. And um, I could uh, maybe cite an example that uh, we worked in a case with uh, so social services in Norway that's uh, abbreviated as NAV. And uh, we had this occasion that um, we suddenly, um, well, we had the Ukrainian war and we suddenly started getting a lot of Ukrainian refugees to Norway. And then it created an impact on um, policy level that you made a new policy on um, uh, that Ukrainian refugees, for the first time, a refugee group that could start working in European Union straight away without any, you know, courses or kind of normally you have an integration program in many European countries before you can start actually working here. And uh, that creates like, um, I, I would maybe this we could call us an emergent quick uh, sudden um, change on the uh, services that you design. And it creates a lot of like um, complex settings as well, because the Previous regulations have said that, okay, if you start working straight away and you didn't take, take your Norwegian classes, you will miss the um, opportunities of uh, future uh, funding, um, or if you will be, you don't have a work in the future. So I think those are like issues that you kind of can map and start working on. But in the mappings that I've been working, and if you want, I can show later. So I think quite often it's the policy, the new laws or things that they create this kind of uh, uh, will shake the system that you work in, within and need to kind of uh, forecast what is coming in the future. Yeah, that's, that's my experience. <laughs> so. That's an interesting. Uh, that's an interesting case study. Um, May I jump in? Yeah, sure, Burger. Um, I just want to say I'm very much in line with uh, Praveen and Sahil. Um, I'm not. I was very worried about uh, those maps being the Giga maps being being uh, stable, sort of, or non-dynamic. But uh, the maps are not necessarily what needs to be where the emergency where emergence happens. It's in the social system and in the conversations, the rivers of conversations, mm -hmm. um, in the process and the social system that uh, is producing the maps. And that reflects back uh, along to the process and it reflects back to the maps. So the map will change, like registering those change and playing back on that and 
for example, um, we observed a lot of um, uh, mapping across silos. It's an, it's really really useful for talking across silos with people who have totally different background, different um, um, expertise, and try to understand each other. So yeah, I mean, I totally agree with Corinne and Sohil that, and I'm not so worried about the maps being being static anymore. <laughs> Um, good. Uh, Lorraine, we haven't heard from you yet. Why don't you say a little bit about um, your feelings on emergence and the mapping process? Yeah, I mean, I I, I just, I mean, I echo uh, a lot of what Praveen and Suhil said about kind of the, the rich design space and Berger's, um, you know, reference to the, the rivers of conversation um, and the, the concept that for me, it's really not about the thing that gets produced. It's about the process of making the thing. Um, and actually um, I have uh, I, in preparation for this, I, I wanted to share um, some images from one of my uh, classes where one of the challenges that I found with a lot of the mapping process and some of the tools that exist is that they're very formal um, looking like the many of the frameworks and tools. I think people start to look at them and they feel like there's a right way to kind of complete those things. And so I actually had my students um, use like low fi prototyping materials to map their systems. And I just wanted to show this is probably not going to be an ideal you know, uh, presentation mode, but I'm wanted to share from my PowerPoint slides, uh, some pictures of what was happening with those students. So I got them to pull off the prototyping cart, a whole bunch of just, you know, like basic uh, materials for, for prototyping. At first, it was really hard for them. They couldn't disconnect from kind of the formalisms that they had seen in other maps, and they got very intimidated by doing that. And then also, often the, the content of what it is that they're mapping. So we're doing synthesis mapping. That's Peter Jones's um, methodology. Um, so we're not working with people who are stakeholders who are outside, so just that. Um, but these students have been very kind of steeped in a lot of research about contexts and, and uh, content that is very important to them. So it's hard for them sometimes to disconnect from that when they're actually doing the mapping. But this um, process, I told them they're, they're one like the brief for it was map your system using as little text as possible. Um, and so they, as a group, had to have conversations about what that looked like. Eventually they started to dig in and things got a lot more kind of fun and less kind of um, connected to what is right and more about kind of uh, illustrating using these materials in a way that is, uh, um, you know, I think, showing some of the dynamism that that we're talking about but also in a way that you know they could quickly explain um to another group what it was that was happening they got really messy um and then eventually here's an example of one sorry i just blacked out the students faces uh where they this group particularly had a real challenge with understanding how they might do their map they were hung up on trying to figure out what was the correct metaphor or what metaphor would be ideal for their for what it was that they were trying to show. And this process of doing this kind of lo-fi map using, you know, like you can see, it's like crepe paper and whatever. They built some three-dimensional kind of structures to like show processes of things that were happening of moving through a gate, et cetera. And they ended up um, coming to a place that was actually much more, uh, you know they were they were much more advanced than what they had anticipated and at the end of this class when we did the reflection all of the groups uh indicated that the releasing the formality actually supported them moving forward which for me is emergence right it's that idea of allowing it to just kind of become um uh in a way that i think is um more natural and for me because i was schooled as a graphic designer this is the way that this happens um, but many of these students are not students who've come through art and design uh, learning. And so for them, it's it, this is a new process. Uh, thanks, Lauren. There's a lot there to discuss. Um, Yota, do you have any thoughts on emergence and mapping? I'm sure you have plenty of um, thoughts. Yeah, good. No, I, I mean, a lot of things have been said and I can completely 
like find myself in what was been said also what Praveen and Birger said about the emergence is also happening in the process not necessarily in the map I see that too in my classrooms where we teach it to bachelor students of a technical university design students plus all different kind of technical students and one particular thing I always see during the five years we've been teaching this is that often in beginning it's very much focused on the technical, the material and mapping that the, the organizations, institutions. And of course, it's always focused on relationships, go, go what's in between. And that's where, where you find the patterns often. Um, and that throughout the class, there's this emergence of much more and more focusing on the social side. And we also connect it often too closely to the leverage point of Danella Meadows. And you see slowly throughout the mapping process and ideation and inspiration, they go much more towards the social, the mental models that is also high on Danella Meadows list. Um, and that's interesting. And, uh, and Lorraine also said this, the, the, the maps, the, one of the things is that it lacks is the dynamics of it. And that maybe that's more towards question three on the limitations. Um, but I, I like your idea, Lorraine, we did similar things in our class, trying to get these different uh, items and different ways of thinking, different tangible things uh, to represent those socials, those uh, uh, intangibles um, that can sometimes help to get to those patterns. And one, one for very practical thing we once did, and that's the last thing I'll say, is that we once used tracing paper over the maps, over the physical maps, different layers of tracing paper on top of it. And every tracing paper had to have a different layer of patterns trying to find in the first sort of lo-fi map that the students made. So uh, different flows to identify on top. It got very messy, um, but it was, an, it, was a, it was an interesting process to see. Uh, thank you. And Peter, we haven't heard from you yet. So why don't you... Um... Chime in a little bit. Oh, of course. Uh, good morning. So I'll, I'll speak to um, what I've learned at, uh, also at OCAD, a systemic design course. And, and one thing that emerged uh, early was that we, we started with the, the synthesis map process really developed out of the, um, you know, starting from giga mapping. But um, as Lorraine had mentioned, um, because we don't have direct, we often don't have direct projects. We look for them, but we often don't have uh, either um, uh, stakeholder access to the mapping process, or we don't have a, a sponsor that we can work with so that we can work in an authentic or an original way with a mapping process. Um, after a couple of years of working with, with mapping, uh, the synthesis map process evolved so that it could meet several different pedagogical goals, but also train our students in learning formal models as well. So this is, so one of the things that's emerged from that is that when we work with um, the, the training, usually in the first half of the course on the formal models, and a lot of these are similar to the, you know, the uses of that have evolved in the, the templates and design journeys in the systemic design toolkit. We've continued to evolve um, formal models from everything from you know, actor mapping and, and uh, the iterative inquiry and, and leverage analysis and causal loop diagrams. And not everyone, you know, one of the things that emerges is that you know, not everybody in a, in a classroom is going to be equally proficient in all of those different formal models. In fact, nobody will become kind of, um, uh, you know, find affinity with all of them, but everyone will find some of them that work with the types of representations or thought processes that make sense to them in a project. So there's intrapersonal and interpersonal variability in learning uh, the formal uh, models so then the synthesis mapping, at least pedagogically, what emerges is that we, uh, and like Lorraine had mentioned, and she has different techniques for, for, for doing this. And, and mine is, um, I, I mean, there is a sketch, we, we set the dossier of the formal models aside, but there has been a, an entire learning process that has gone on for several weeks um, in, in learning those formal, formal models. 
what this, uh, then we, we have teams take what they've learned and start to sketch, work from timelines, work with different spatial representations. Uh, and this becomes an uncomfortable and ambiguous process for many of the teams. So one of the, so we do um, support, for, especially for those teams that sometimes may not have any graphic or, or may not have the confidence or the time to kind of work with the graphical skills, they can still work with the formal models and kind of bricolage something together that comes out of learning, uh, you know, the, the different um, uh, modeling styles. But in the synthesis, where what emerges from the learning is, is a deeper understanding that becomes a holistic representation of from the research that they've used to, you know, develop the expression to the, the story that they're trying to tell, the visual narrative. Um, here, I can, I can share uh, an example of this because this is something we've spoken to uh, a lot. So I'll just uh, um, uh, show you, you should see, this is pretty well known map in the, uh, maybe not everyone in the, uh, you know, who's, who's dialing in today has seen it, but I mean, it was in the cover of Sheji. Um, uh, journal special issue after RSD5. So one of our, the, the visual narrative of the brain being plugged into the wall and the expression of, is it time to pull the plug, emerged, I mean, it just like popped into place with two weeks left in the course. So after you know six or seven weeks of learning the formal models, which you can see a number of which are actually embedded in the diagram, but they are also uh, presented in a way that you know they are not. Um, it does not require you know the the viewer to know the methodology to understand what's being presented. So the you know the, then there were there were. Um, a number of messy and uh, messy sketches and interpretations that that continued for weeks after the formal models, and the visualization did not uh, and of the brain and of the rendering, um, it, you know, started to emerge with uh, about ten days to fourteen days left in the whole class. And so it's you know this isn't like a matter of like oh it will it, you know the perfect answer will pop into place at the end. Um, you know, and it does take some graphic design confidence to for a map like for a, the visual designer, in this case, Pupil Bish, who is the lead designer for this, to bring it all together. Uh, but, you know, it, this happens regularly, that there are, you know, the visual metaphor will come together as an emergence and not as a contrivance, not, not constructed uh, from the beginning as, you know, wouldn't it be great to tell this narrative in this kind of story? This emerged from the learning process. It also didn't have a direct client. And I'll just say quickly, when we do have direct clients, we do have, apologize, this one is a PDF, but this is the primary care in cancer system, but you can see it's kind of a roadmap metaphor. And in, in what emerged in this, an actual kind of sponsored client paid project with, with um, you know, a, a, a team developing it with a sponsor. Again, it's a synthesis map process deriving it from the research. The metaphor did emerge after, you know, multiple different sketches, but what completely emerged that was unexpected, um, I mean, it should have been expected, but it was um, unplanned for and, un, and, and not paid for. We did this on our own is that the patient perspective in the flow of in the flow of of patients within a healthcare system gets lost and so what emerged was you know in working with patient advisors was that we had to have a patient centered representation we used uh, human you know uh, human representations that were hand sketched uh, we showed that whole flow that you saw in the other diagram in the center and then used a different type of presentation that showed the uh, from the patient perspective there it is a completely non-linear and kind of broken and emotional process and it's a completely different story so what emerged was the need for a completely different representation which we then created and then created that um 
you know, with the patient advisors so that it actually told their story as well. So that's, so it's this learning process, the visualization emerges, the learning and the interaction with the sponsor definitely helps something else emerge that we weren't planning for. And I think that the learning the formal methods expands the, the visual vocabulary for people that are often new to mapping. So it does give them it, it gives the teams people in the, you know, gives them a toolkit that they can start to expand on. That emerges as well. So, you know, me. Okay. Thank you, Peter. That's uh, very insightful. I appreciate that. So I, I, I feel like we're actually all sort of very much in agreement right now that there's something in the process of mapping that allows for things to emerge. Um, I'm wondering though, a little bit about what happens after that process, right? So I had um, a thesis advisor once tell me that uh, your your thesis is never finished. It's just something you stop working on. And I feel like there's some truth to, to that in mapping as well, right? Your, your system map is never really finished. It's just something you stop working on. Um, and I'm wondering though, at some point though, you hand that off to the client or um, it goes on, it takes on a life of its own. How do we keep track of emergence after that happens? Right. Once the map is delivered, uh, how does it stay a site of emergence for people who are working in the system on the problems that have been represented in the map? Um, do people have thoughts on whether that happens or how to how to ensure that it does? Well, I'll just add it definitely happens and it can be a problem for the mapping team because we have to learn to let go of them. Uh, I have especially when you work for months on on maps for sponsors. And and it and it and you continue and we continue to learn on our own and realize oh we could have really you know if we had had another couple of weeks or if if we could actually be in the client's shoes to instead to be the ones to present the story out of the map it's the uh, you know sometimes in turning over uh, the re the results of the work especially to a sponsor or to a client. It's almost as if they, you know, even if they've been deeply involved, like, oh, you're doing it wrong. You're not, you're not telling the story in the way that we would. I mean, there are all these other nuances that we become really deeply familiar with and that we're continuing to learn on. We have to learn to let go of them, I think, um, because they will continue to uh, live and, and, uh, and, and take on a, something of a life of their own. Uh, they have a trajectory to them, in a, you know, as a, as a learning process. And I'm not sure it's always that way with clients. So to me, the goal would be to get the clients and sponsors to be able to express it and to continue to work with that as an artifact in, in that way for themselves. Yeah, uh, sorry, uh, your, your day is gone. Yeta, you have your hand up. Yeah, I was indeed thinking about, I mean, you, you said it nicely, it's just something you stop working on and often indeed that's one of the problems with the maps, right? There's there's this project or thing and you stop working on and you, but the sponsors or the person that you are working for or the group you're working with, they don't because often it's complex issues you're working with, complex problems or transitions over longer term and they don't stop. And they evolve. So indeed, it would be great if there is a way to keep those maps dynamically alive. And sort of also in this moment of transfer, although maps, I, and I know bigger is very adamant on this, they're not communication models. And actually, they maybe they should be destroyed at the end of the process. Um, that's which I can also uh, find myself in. Although the narrative that is formed based on these maps, that's uh, something that would be so good to transfer in a way and maybe map is not the right idea but the knowledge and the learning from these maps that's something you want to transfer and maybe the map is not the right way but I do agree in the limitations of this moment of transfer. Berger you want to respond? Yeah I mean <clears throat> to the stop problem we have done a lot especially Andreas you might know he has done a lot of um, giga mapping workshops from a few hours to two days with um, leadership uh, groups where all the maps were thrown away after that. And what the takeaway is that 
conversation and that experience and that uh, all this emergence from that workshop and the map is thrown away. So it's not not necessary always to keep those maps alive. And another small <laughs> remark footnote is that uh, I think Rittel had a lot to say about the stop problem. That uh, in as the nature of systemic design or sy systems um, thinking projects that you you will never know what is the right moment to stop or it won't be finished. It is always something that could continue there. Um, Lorraine, you had to, you want to respond as well? Yeah, I just want to say uh, from my from my experience too uh, in doing this as uh, like for for a client or a sponsor, they often choose to use the artifact as like a as a, a site for narrative. Like I've had clients take the the map and produce it and like hang it up in their space as like an example of something and then go back to it and use it to almost run people through the narrative uh, over and over again. And for me, the challenge in that is that yes, it's a it's a slice in time that is has been captured that may not necessarily extend beyond, you know, I don't know how long that truth truth is going to be true, right? Like I I don't know how long. So I it's funny, Berger, to to hear uh, the the idea, or well, you to brought it up of you know possibly destroying the thing at the end. I, I think that's interesting to me. I think clients have, would have a real challenge with it, but it's very interesting to me because it does worry me often um, that this then becomes this thing that is now uh, you know like canonized as kind of the thing that is the truth, and it is it is that goes completely against the concept of emergence. So, uh, Praveen, you have some comments, and then I see Francis yeah. at the gallery has a hand up. So we'll we'll swap over to yeah. that. Yeah, no, very uh, very quick one. Uh, uh, see, uh, the map actually for us when we do this uh, over uh, you know ten weeks of project, the map the mapping or the developing a giga map in the in the artifact form, it only use uh, two weeks or uh, maybe less than two weeks sometimes, and it's a group uh, kind of a work of three or four people coming together. And they kind of uh, pull this off, but uh, uh, and then it is pushed towards the last day uh, when they have to present in the jury, and then you know we kind of try to see what is coming out of that, and and there are a lot of surprises comes, and so a lot of people fall apart because they have not handled the files properly, and their colors and typo and hierarchies are not uh, you know visible. They still kind of work in progress, and uh, we kind of. Well, let people live with that uh, sense of you know open endedness and uh, you know the emergent uh, point and then they can sort of always kind of uh, build it further as they uh, as they move on uh, uh. but surprisingly uh, you know people who sit for placements uh, these days and you know there are so many clients looking at the processes of uh, building this and outcomes of this and actually people are finding very interesting opportunities to work uh, 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 beyond their imagination of what, uh, you know, so this is actually that giga mapping as a, as a skill or, uh, and, uh, you know, building those complexity maps along with all this thing is, is a very, very uh, uh, interesting skill which has emerged. Of course, you kind of do a teamwork and you do a skill share, you have to handle softwares, you know, you have to handle very high uh, open-ended files so it's also about how do you sort of uh, pull the skills you know get people from graphic design and wherever uh, you know possible to make sure that something works and also the outcome of such projects for us is uh, not the giga map is but one this is one of the one of the outcome there may be 100 or you know 20 other outcomes and, uh, and you know possible uh, you know, this thing so i think we are kind of we enjoyed to see uh, that it opened in less of the of the map. Yeah. Uh, thank you. And uh, Francis, you wanted to add something to this conversation. Sorry, I, I was just trying to write my question. And I'm sorry, I joined late, but uh, it was a question related to this artifact, the tangible versus this capability, which is the intangible. 
and I'm interested in both, but I'm more concerned about the intangible is how do you scale and rep rep replicate, if you can call that, use that term, how can you scale out this capability to map so that it's just not what I call a yako, yet another consulting offering. So any comments on that? Uh, so I, if I get your question, it's really sort of about the, the, the democratization of mapping as a process, right? How do you give it to potentially even your stakeholders to continue onward after you've they've sort of left your expert practice, right? Yes, and uh, it's the biggest point. Uh, and just as disclosure, I'm a student at AHU, and Birke is my guide on my thesis. So um, I'm, I'm curious about how uh, we ensure that, that, that you know, just the, the dis dissemination, not in any ritualistic manner, but just as a capability, you know, broad capability. Because I, I've been a consultant for the last 40 years, and I think it's, it has been fairly toxic. Um, mm -hmm. But uh, so that's my concern. So um, a lot of times because we end up doing uh, uh, projects which are live, like we have people uh, from nearby who are our actual stakeholders. So uh, we document the entire course really heavily. And uh, we also create, like we encourage students to have their own blogs. So it's sort of over the period of 10 weeks, it builds. And we encourage them because uh, you you do a lot of reading, you do a lot of talking to people, you observe a lot. So how they sort of map their entire journey of the project in terms of what did they read, what resources did they come across, and also when they create outcomes. So we have students, uh, one of our uh, well-known project, Decoding Empathy. So the Giga map became really famous, which was like a factory. But that was just a portion of it. So the students had created a playbook, which the teachers in school could use for making uh, children more empathetic. And the way, uh, and what we do is we also create a narrative around it. So if you're looking at the map, there would be ways of reading the map, which sort of plugs in the interventions or the outcomes which we have mapped. And then people start cross connecting them. And over a period of time, it starts having a life of its own because you'll start cross referencing. So uh, maintaining or creating these digital assets along with analog helps us sort of make it reach like far further than otherwise. And maybe what I'll also uh, highlight is uh, rather than scaling up, maybe it also could be critical to replicate because scaling up at times could be problematic because it depends on a lot of other things, but replicating it from the context, the local context could help us also reimagine uh, the work done from our own surroundings. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, just to speak on that, the question about scaling and the, the idea of not a consulting offering. So, uh, for me, I think the biggest challenge often in doing this work is the lack of understanding in kind of just the general world about the concept of making to learn, that we use the process of making as, as how we learn and understand things. And I think there's, a, there's such a disconnect um, between kind of seeing beautiful things and people believing that somehow there's some kind of magic that has gone into creating a beautiful thing that they're not visible of, rather than understanding that there's been a whole lot of mess making that has happened in advance of making that beautiful thing. So for me, um, if we could scale out the concept of making to learn, and if we could kind of democratize the idea that uh, making is a knowledge and our hands have knowledge is um, but that our brains often do not. I, I think that would be the best way that we could scale mapping as a process. When I hear people talking about this, I it, it seems to me that we're talking about trying to extend the fundamental um, sort of process or approaches that we have to mapping by adding in new kinds of mapping tools, new ways of thinking about mapping, and that this, in fact, is probably some way of capturing um, things that are inherent in the system that maybe 
purely graphical approaches or even mixed graphic intangible approaches are, are unable to capture. Um, a number of people in the in the chat have talked about um, the potential of adding digital tools to mapping, which I know some people do in their practice. Um, and I'm wondering what sort of, um, what kinds of emergence are we unable to capture in traditional mapping techniques or even what kinds of emergence are suited to different kinds of mapping techniques, right? So are there things we can capture when using graphics and discussion that we can't capture tangibly or vice versa? Or are there things that can't be captured in digital tools because of their limitations that we can capture in other ways? Um, have people explored this idea before and what have you come up with? Um, I think when data is involved, it's much easier to you know, have dynamic updating. I think when we have the visual objects, like I work in many, many tools, like Illustrator isn't necessarily an automatic update kind of tool. Um, yeah, I mean, you have different programs. Like a lot of people use Kumu, but it's limited in its flexibility and it's more data driven. Um, I haven't seen as much in the kind of in the visual space. You could use JavaScript projects. That's I've worked in interactive for a really long time. And I think some of the JavaScript capabilities are a way to update. I'd be curious, you know, I'm also looking at a lot of 3Ds. So Unity, you know, I'd be curious what people are seeing there. I've been looking at uh, data analytics in 3D as well. Um, Neo4j, graph databases. And I'll stop there. I'd be curious what other people are seeing. Okay. Well, I I like what you're saying, Claudia, but also uh, I saw Anna Bergmark in the chat saying something about the possible paternalism in making maps and things. And Evan, you said, what are we unable to capture? And I think one thing we always really forget in making the maps and what emergence we're not capturing is the maker's point of view, sort of that's almost uh, goes to the background or the, it's the foreground, but actually our maker's process, the process we were talking before, but also our, our viewpoint, all those things, we don't make them explicit or tangible in these processes. And I think that that's um, something that we could pay more attention to in mapping processes. Uh, and I don't have a direct solution of how to do that. You were asking for that too. Uh, but I do think it's very important because always in science, there's also always this thing that you, and in design, you cannot be outside the system. You cannot say, I'm, I'm neutral. You always have a sort of uh, standpoint and to make it more explicit in a map that has uh, also been underlying through the process of making the map, I think that's something uh, to capture better. Okay. Um, yeah, I almost lost the uh, <laughs> uh, What does it, does it doesn't capture on how good digital approaches or other models or other ways? Um, in our work, we always thought that uh, we, we, we are really, we, we are referring a lot to to Gerald Mitchley and uh, and uh, critical systems thinking and uh, this kind of methodological pluralism, which says that there is no not one model or one method that would cover all the aspects of the living world. So uh, the solution on that is is to use several different perspectives methodologies etc doesn't guarantee that you get it right but it gets slightly better and we think of the giga map as a as a place where you can um, invite all those other different models with so, uh, systems dynamics modeling or other or statistics or spreadsheets or whatever and 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 invite them into the giga map uh, populate the giga map with those different models and draw relations between them because what is missing with this all these different modeling principles also data modeling etc is that they just tell a part of the story and when it comes to digital um we haven't pursued that a lot because it's so resource demanding and not only resource demanding, but it actually influences so strongly your thinking because you start to invest a lot in 
those models and maybe spend hours on programming. And that is a very strong, um, something that really influences very, very strongly how you think. All of these um, tools and methods are very influential on ways you're thinking. So in our case, um, what is really cool is this, the maps that you throw away afterwards that are just very messy and are drafts and they have done something to your thinking. And the, it's, it doesn't cost a lot to throw them away if you have found out the, that you were wrong or you went down a, a rabbit hole or something. So there's no, no not one answer to this, but uh, yeah. Uh, so Birger, I want to pick up on that and bring back in a thread around the sort of time and resources that it takes to build a map. And if you are simply building something and throwing it away at the end, um, it seems a difficult thing to maybe even justify to a client, right? Um, who wants something tangible as a product. Um, and even in regard to the democratization of mapping, right? Not everyone has the the time and the resources to continue this activity long after um, the designers have left the table. And so um, it does seem to be that there's a fundamental question here of um, how we might um, sort of uh, maybe lower the barrier to entry for the mapping process or um, somehow better entrench it into more traditional practices um, to make it something that people can continue to do after uh, after the the designers have sort of left the table, um, uh, just a, just a very short comment. Uh, those maps that were thrown away, that these were were in commission processes with clients. That's where it happened, not in a pedagogical setting. And did the did the clients? So they were paid for, <laughs> paid for, and thrown away. <laughs> um, so, other sort of responses to that idea. What about the time and resources needed to do this work? I can say something about that. Yeah, yeah. I mean, uh, one of the reasons that Crystal Van Ale and I, you know, developed um, and are continuing to develop um, the different, you know, 30 canvases that are in the free, you know, downloadable systemic design toolkit and that are encompassed in the design journey through complex systems book is an attempt to democratize the process so that what we call tourists and explorers, people like us who are really advanced in techniques or could develop our own tools would be explorers and can adapt and use these tools in advanced ways. But there are there is always going to be a much, much larger um, you know, proportion of people that are interested in learning to think, reason, model, and map you know, um, from a very basic starting point or from a point of their own access to it, including, you know, the multiple people that may be part of the different leadership or sponsor client or research groups that we're working with. There may be more and more people that may have been peripherally involved and weren't directly involved in mapping teams and things like that. The, um, the, the creation of these kind of symbols simple formalisms and reducing them to their essential their essential um, characteristics. Um, you know, it was very much a deliberate process to try to democratize um, the uh, visualization, metaphorical, and also technically correct ways of using, you know, different uh, formal systems thinking models that could be visualized and and used in systemic design ways. So there's no, we call it a systemic design methodology, but it's a methodology. It's not meant to be, you know, canonical in any way. It's meant to be democratic in a sense that, or democ in, in the sense of, of making it accessible to a larger number of, of people and for, for them to, to, to learn from it and to continue to use it. And so when we get the opportunity to really train people, and it's hard to get these ideas across just in a, in a fairly short book, but in, in training, we're very clear about, you know, this is especially for the tourists, it's a starting point. You would never use all of the tools. You, you know, learn a subset. These are tools for learning 
pro thinking practices and then and then there's even a template for a, a synthesis map which really doesn't do justice at all to the technique but it is surprisingly you know good and fast for you know a, a, a very low time investment for people to kind of come up with a first approach to an integration or to a, a synthesis of their own thinking so there are you know different purposes for the techniques in mapping um, but you know to develop you know whether it's you know whether it's going to be and there are different styles even in synthesis maps depending on the kind of projects but you know if we're doing one that's going to be for under commission and the sponsors really want you know the artifact to be used in their in their policy making decision making or their or for you know at their conferences and presentations you know we want that to reflect their perspectives not ours so we really do you know as much empathic translation as we can to um, you know to work work with them as if it were you know a, a service design process thanks peter mari you have your hand up yeah, I could uh, tell also I, ha I have big struggles with time, I think, uh, or it's a challenge when I've been doing on uh, mess mapping, which is a tool uh, created by um, emeritus researcher from Stanford University, Robert Horn. But uh, as a solo author or solo facilitator, not the author, sorry, facilitator of the process. So for me, it takes always half a year that I try to make workshops with the uh, people involved um, with the mapping. And I, I assume that uh, Robert makes it much, much faster because he probably has a crew of people and they, then he has a, has a possibility, you know, to make parallel sessions and, and, and make it a bit more um, agile. And, and what I felt with my stakeholders that they are not ready to engage in such a long process. Often they want immediate solutions to bigger problems. They don't like to deep dive like uh, into this on the root causes of their services and problems. They they want something that alleviates their situation now. <laughs> so, um, but then you, you don't go to the systemic level and the change if you don't go deep dive very down in a way. But one way I've been also trying to learn a bit more about the giga mapping because it is more agile so you can do it a bit more faster and um and that's that way save save the time but uh of course there's a challenge that uh, i need to always bring my stakeholders along the process so that they take the ownership of the of the process as well so i, I must say that I'm, I'm still in the way of discovering this <laughs> myself and maybe it's something that we can get like the peer support in this community yeah thanks yeah. so uh, we have a few oh Berger, you wanted to say something yeah just one point here that we often are looking at those very elaborate maps that are really developed graphically etc but that's not always necessary but on the other side the, the graphic development of the map is also a, a thinking process it's not only for showing off or showing something nice, but it also for that, because it gives value to the map, but it's most of all a thinking process where you reorganize and rethink everything you have been through. Um, thank you. Uh, we have about five minutes left in our time together, and I wanted to open up um, the floor for additional questions from uh, people in the gallery right now. So. If you have a question, please just raise your hand. That will bring you to the front of the queue and I can see you. And uh, then you can just unmute and ask your question. Oris, yes, please go ahead. Thank you. Uh, my question is uh, to everyone, of course, but particularly to Lorraine who brought something up in the uh, the discussion of three-dimensional uh, forms of uh, systems oriented design or giga mapping or different types of mapping and the data analysis involved in it. So I wondered if you could speak more to some of the folks making in that space. Some of the folks making in, in the three dimensional form space. That's right. That's right. Um, so I don't know, to be quite honest with you, uh, that literally was me in the middle of, of uh, teaching systems uh, for the first time going there they need a thing that is more material 
because of my experience uh, coming up through graphic design and making and understanding the processes of making as a way of learning. So I'm not certain. Um, I know we've had a few people talk about three-dimensionality in digital spaces, but I'm not sure if there are people who are working on material three-dimensional examples of systems. I know Evan works in games. I don't know if that's something that exists or not. I guess I ask because that's the focus of my of my work and my process is is uh, is working in these interdisciplinary methods, but with the the neuroscience of the visual spatial backing it and the the use of uh, of gaming engines to to advance it. So uh, I guess uh, uh, if uh, no one uh, has any leads, I would love to discuss. Even if it's not here, I'll just add my email in the chat if anyone would like to reach out and discuss. Thank you so much. Yeah, or as we should talk offline. There's a there's a lot to that that um, I can help you explore. Yeah, um, thank you very much, everyone. Um, I did post the question in regards to what Mari was mentioning in uh, respect to her work um, with the Ukrainian newcomers, and you mentioned you would be able to share something. I would be very curious also because what you mentioned about um, the need or the requirement of acceleration versus deceleration is something that very much resonated um, with the work that we're doing here in Berlin. So Mari, if you could share anything, I know time is very short, but I would be very curious. Uh, but this is about uh, uh, unemployed uh, middle-aged men in Finnish Lapland, but thinking about the, that you have some kind of like a policy that is coming and it will change any back the system. So maybe it's a bit similar to the Ukrainian case that you have something that happens and will um, kind of um, change the system. So in Finland, they were still debating in uh, the politicians. This map is like from 2018, I think. But this regulation law policy still haven't gone through. So they are still debating. We have had even uh, governments that failed because and people would resign because they were not able to pass this new renovation of social and health sick, uh, services. So this is something that it's still on the uh, mystery card of the future, how it will impact like the system of healthcare and uh, social services like in, in, in Finland in general. But it's just kind of like an example that, you know, you have a policy and messes up everything. <laughs> so, or only the case you have before or, or such like an event that um, emerges and, and changes things. And then you need to think about the impact in a larger system. Thank you, Mani. I don't know if that answers. <laughs> Well, it was a, a, a peek into your, thank you very much for making time for this. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I'm mean, happy to discuss later if you wish. Yeah. Um, so thank you, everyone. This brings us to the end of our hour together. Um, I've been trying to keep up in the chat uh, to no avail. It's, uh, it's, it's quite <laughs> active in there. Um, and so uh, I would encourage everyone to just sort of take a moment to uh, maybe save the chat. Um, there's a lot of really interesting discussion happening in there. Um, and apologies if we couldn't include you in the discussion today. Um, but there is uh, quite a bit going on in this space. And it's really nice to see such an active and robust discussion. Um, and it's lovely to see everyone. Um, and uh, I hope that everyone got a little bit out of this, um, maybe even a little bit more than a little, maybe a lot. Um, and uh, hope to see you all at a future Mapping Monday. Um, Cheryl, actually, are you still here? Do you have a schedule for the Mapping Mondays that we can maybe announce to people before they leave? It's on the website, so rsdsymposium.org. Just go to the blue menu, and uh, you'll see the mapping drop down. Um, I regret, I can't recall what's next week, but every week is pretty exciting. And this has been really exciting for me. And I'll have the summary notes posted today, and you'll get an email if you want to. Uh, recap. I was just about to give up on doing maps this year. And then we've had this wonderful outcome uh, with lots of interest and uh, discussion. So I think we'll even have some extra sessions to add on. We seem to be gathering, gathering uh, more interest as we go. So thanks. This has been great. Uh, our, our student uh, Aditi, Aditi Shinde, she's doing some wonderful uh, sketch notes. Aditi, are you there? She did. I think. Uh, yes, time. yes, I'm here. Uh, thank you so much for the session, actually. And uh, as a systems design student, I think 
I related a lot with the tool of mapping and for us personally and our group, it really helped us untangle, you know, and it's definitely a tool that uh, kept us on the same page and uh, understanding what all of you guys uh, actually work in the professional field with clients and, you know, actually getting them on the same page and working with um, on like wicked problems and stuff that was quite insightful. So thank you so much. Thanks. Thanks for being here, everyone. So good to see us all. Thanks, Evan. Thank you. you. Also... <laughs> Thank you. Thanks, Evan. Cheryl. Everyone. Thanks, Thank you. Thank you, Roundtable. Thank you. Take care, everyone. Yeah. Bye. Ciao.